All right, there you oh, go. No, hey, no, James. <laughs> <laughs> Too late now. Yeah. yeah How's yeah. it going? Hope, hope that talk's done. Oh, yeah, okay. I think it is. Wasn't right. polishing it at the last minute. Always. That's that's the way you got to do these things. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, James, welcome. Um, you are kicking this off, so I'm, I hope you are ready. Uh, we have lots of viewers right now, so this is probably the biggest audience um, that you will get this afternoon. Yep. Um, with that, I will bring on your slides and uh, let's let, let you introduce the talk in yourself as well. So, uh, good luck. Hey, everyone. As you might be able to tell from the title of this talk, it's about algorithms, it's about performance, it's about Levenstein distance. I have a lot of things to cover, so we're going to skip this slide. Performance it can be kind of a funny subject depending on what you're working on because improving performance can be limited to just better database queries or throwing some caching at the problem. But for a different set of problems, performance falls more into what algorithms you use to process data and how much memory you're allocating. This talk focuses more on the latter, being smarter with algorithms and taking advantage of the features that are available to us in .NET. The algorithm I'll be going through today is Levenstein distance and my journey to push it to its performance to the extreme. Levenstein distance tells us how similar two strings are by returning a value that represents the number of operations needed to transform one string into the other. The smaller the distance, the more similar the two strings. If you know your big O notation though, you'll see this algorithm is pretty inefficient. In my case, I wanted to use Levenstein distance between two web pages at a different point in time. So after stripping all the HTML and anything else out of the way, I could be left with you know, a few thousand characters to tens of thousands of characters. So I had a lot to process. To get an understanding though of the performance optimizations that I can even talk about with this, it's important for me to walk through how you'd even typically calculate Levenstein distance. So let's walk through a simple example with Saturday and Sunday. So imagine a matrix like that's on screen. The blue cell is the cell that we're calculating. The cell to the left is the insertion costs, above the deletion costs, and the top left cell is our substitution cost. And it's the combination of these cells that are core to calculating Levenstein distance. We track the minimum value of the insertion and deletion costs as a variable, and then we add one to this result, which in this case is two. With the substitution cost, we track that and we add one to it if the current letters of the cells don't match. So in this case, our cell has both capital letters S, so they match, so we don't add anything here. So our value is zero for substitution cost. We then take the minimum value of both these that we calculated. So our final result that we save into the cell is zero. This process repeats for the next cell with an insertion cost of zero, deletion cost of two, and a substitution cost of one. Using the same formula as before, the result for this cell is one. We repeat this for the rest of the row, and then for every row in the matrix. The value we want, the Levenstein distance, is in the bottom right corner. This means, for our example here with Saturday and Sunday, the Levenstein distance is three. There are three essential elements to our baseline implementation. The data structure, representing our matrix to do calculations in. The data initialization, where we set up our first row and column with incrementing numbers. And finally, the main calculation logic, which does the bulk of our processing. This is our baseline implementation in C-sharp. Nothing too crazy going on here, but it's also not overly optimized either. We use link to create a jagged array for our data structure. We have two loops for our data initialization. And then we have a nested loop for our main calculation logic. At 10 characters, it takes a little under 600 nanoseconds to run, but we're allocating a kilobyte of memory. So that doesn't seem that bad. But at 10,000 characters, we're taking over half a second to process and allocating 381 megabytes of memory. Even if I could get away with it taking half a second of time to process, that memory usage is gonna be brutal to performance. The thing is, we can significantly improve both the time it takes and the memory usage. To do so though, we need to work out how we want to approach the problem. Of the information we learned from previous benchmark run, the memory allocations were gonna be the biggest initial problem, but why exactly? It's that the time and space complexity of the algorithm hurts us big time on large strings. In its most basic form that we've implemented, we're allocating a whole matrix for our processing. With that in mind, 
it's probably best to have a poke around the algorithm to see if there are any secrets to avoid needing to allocate the whole matrix. So take a look at the matrix again. Highlighted is one row of processing. All of the values used in the calculation. We are only using the current and previous rows. So why do we create a whole matrix? Instead, we could just alternate between two rows of data. This has a dramatic decrease in the memory requirements. Previously, we had a space complexity of n plus one squared, and now it's only n plus one times two. And while that's a significant improvement, we can do even better than this. We can get away with using just one row for our previous deletion costs, because the substitution and insertion costs start from a known predictable point. So we can track those as just regular variables. This lowers our space complexity to just n. Here's of what that could look like in C-sharp, but let's step through the specific changes. First, we have less allocations from no jagged array or link usage. We have one less initialization loop, which gives us a minor performance gain. And our smart variables from the initial substitution and insertion costs. Using a single row, we're significantly faster, up to 57% faster than our baseline already. And we're only just a few minutes into this presentation. We get that while removing 99.9% .9 of allocations for our 10,000 character example. But this was only possible for having a better understanding of the algorithm. These changes, though, give us an opportunity to now look at what framework features we can use to remove allocations entirely. Using a array pool, we can make the algorithm allocation free. Because currently, every call to our method, our get distance method, it allocates a new temporary array that we're just throwing out at the end of the calculation. Instead, we can just rent from the array pool and just return once we're done. When used properly, array pool can be extremely useful for avoiding allocations. With array pool, we can see that not only are allocations gone, but we also have a small increase in performance. While there are some limitations with array pool, like the max pool size, it works well for us in our use case. With memory allocations eliminated, Let's take another look at the algorithm. This is our full matrix again of Saturday versus Sunday. But there's something interesting about this example. It actually contains a smaller matrix that has the same Levenstein distance in less cells. What's happening here is that common prefixes and suffixes don't impact the result. We can start calculating from the first different character and finishing on the last. Effectively, this would be like trimming our strings of matching characters. In this example, after trimming matching characters at the start and end, we would only need to process eight cells, not 48. This is what a basic trimming implementation could look like in C-sharp. This section being the primary part that does the logic, which is checking the strings at the start and the end, identifying the start indexes and adjusting the string lengths. This is the other important part of our implementation. This actually is getting us our trim string. But using substring method on the original strings is a bit of a problem because we're allocating memory now to create a new string, undoing our previous efforts to make our code allocation free. We don't actually need a string though. We just need something that we can index to access the individual characters. So instead of creating a new string, we can use span slice. So span is just like a span of memory, whether it's pointers, arrays, or strings. Our slice is a span with a specific offset and length. Like I mentioned before though, we don't need a new string, just something that we can reference for individual characters, and span fits that perfectly. We keep the trimming code from earlier, except slicing instead of creating substring. In our case, span is a drop-in replacement for referencing the source and target strings, with only need to do some variable renaming for clarity. Back to trimming though, it only works if the strings have anything to be trimmed. So this is a special benchmark to test the performance with and without common prefixes and suffixes. The trimming variant performs slightly worse when there's nothing to trim, but this is to be expected. We're doing extra calculation that isn't really of any help now. But when there are characters to trim, it performs much faster. One thing worth drawing our attention to with these results is the performance of our previous best implementation. Even though it has no trimming support, it also performs measurably faster when our strings have common prefixes and suffixes, 
beyond any error margins that we might have in our data. This relates to branch predictability. Our code has a lot of branches. Longer strings means more branches to process. Using hardware counters, we can see how many mispredictions each path has. So in this benchmark, random data takes about 80% longer to process with around nine times the mispredictions in our more predictable test. Here's a reminder of our branch and logic in our inner loop. We have three branches. One branch for comparing the characters and two branches for the minimum value logic. And all three of these branches run in every iteration of the loop. The problem is how often our loop runs and the potential of the randomness of the data. So longer strings make this more of a problem due to the algorithmic complexity or Levenstein distance. So for 10,000 characters, our inner loop would have to run 100 million times. There is an algorithmic trick though, where we can improve the branch predictability. It all depends on the character comparison. In the substitution costs only adds one if the characters are different. So I've highlighted all the cells with matching characters. The substitution cost is always lower in these cases than the insertion or deletion costs. With that in mind, why do we do the minimum value check when the characters are the same? We can just use the substitution cost directly. Primarily, we're just reordering our code and the logic to do the minimum value checks if the characters are different. This gives us the best case for matching characters and having two less branches to process. In the worst case, with no matching characters, this would be the same as it was before, having just three branches. Those two fewer branches when characters are equal shows us considerably large performance improvement in this particular example, just shy of 60% faster. What is interesting about this is our path when the characters are predictably not equal also has a performance improvement, though there wouldn't be any less branches to process. When we start optimizing on this level, Cascading changes can occur with how the JIT processes our code. We can see this to some extent with the code size column. It represents the combined size of all the CPU instructions required for our code. So the code size now is 38 bytes smaller just from reorganizing our C-sharp code. To understand what is going on, it requires us to see the code the JIT generates. Often I'm typically leaning on something like LinkPad or SharpLab to do this, but there are a number of different tools available. With them, we can see how a small change in our C-sharp impacts the JIT. Here's a short, unrelated example to Levenstein distance. So on the left, we have an array item in, at the fourth index is multiplied by an array item in the fifth index. You might think the right then would just access these values and multiply the result, but not quite. We have two branches indicated by jump instructions, and both of which jump to a call instruction. This is bounds checking in C sharp in action. But what if we change the four and five indexes around? When swapped, we have one less branch to check and a smaller assembly because five surprisingly is greater than four. It no longer needs to assert the bounds check twice. This is an example of how small changes can have larger changes to the output. An output like this would perform marginally faster for having one less branch. Now we've seen the impact from such small operations, let's have a look at our calculation logic to see if we can help the JIT out. Our source span reference here uses row index, which is set in the outer loop, but we're accessing the item in every iteration of the inner loop. The JIT can struggle to notice something like this as it can't just recognize every pattern. So being mindful of how we write our code, we can give the JIT a hand. All we do is lift the data access to the outer loop. We have effectively the same business logic, just better positioned. But what will this do for our benchmark? So we can get a minor performance improvement. That small difference though, scales with larger strings because of how often the inner loop runs. It also allowed the JIT to tweak other related parts of the code, as we also now have a smaller code size. Now, that's what I would say, and was true when I originally prepared these benchmarks under .NET 5, but in some last minute benchmark runs I did for this presentation, the story changes a little bit for .NET 6. Our code varies between performing similar to our previous code, all the way up to running 14% slower. I haven't had the time to really dive into the specifics, but I would surmise that we're now getting in the way of other JIT optimizations. But really, this is a lesson to show how sensitive the JIT can be to certain changes of our code. 
and the importance of benchmarks when you're pushing your code to the edge. But moving on from here, though, let's take a look at what else we can do to improve performance. Pointers. Let's remove spans and use pointers everywhere, because you know pointers make everything faster, right? <laughs> they do. The pointers made the code up to 9% faster, but it isn't exactly that cut and dry. So running this particular benchmark with and without that source character optimization I mentioned before affects our results greatly. So with it, the performance optimization that slowed us down, we actually go much faster getting these results here. But without that optimization, we actually end up being slower by doing this pointer work. But for now, just to keep things simple, we're going to continue with that source character optimization so we can have the best performance here. But the main reason that we want to use pointers at all is that we can get performance from the lack of bounds checking that is now required. It does mean we lose some of the built-in safety working with C-sharp, and we can potentially read and write outside of the memory that we should be. But this is kind of one of the cases where I wanted the performance. You, you really want your extensive testing around code like this because you can somewhat easily corrupt memory. So just to recap where we're at now, so we're 70% faster at 10,000 characters, and we're doing that all without allocating any memory. So you might be thinking, how can we possibly make this go any faster? But that's when we dive into the fun world of hardware intrinsics. Hardware intrinsics allow us accessing specialized instructions on a CPU that can accelerate ex specific workloads. These, these instructions from additional capabilities sit on top of the CPU's base architecture. So for example, x86 is a base architecture and AVX2 is the additional capability. Since .NET Core 3, we can call these to accelerate our code. The majority of these instructions relate to the concept of single instruction, multiple data, or SIMD for short. What SIMD allows us to do is perform an action to a set of data at once. Rather than operating on individual values, we perform work on a vector. So here's a basic example showing two eight-value vectors added together. For Levenstein distance, there are a couple of ways we can use it. Starting with our trimming, we can use SIMD to help us compare multiple characters at once to find out how much we can trim. We need to do two passes, one comparing from the start of the strings, and once again comparing from the end. Now we need to do a little processing on our result to get the actual number of characters to trim. There is a hardware intrinsic that we can call that can count the leading and trailing zeros of a value. We compared if the characters are equal earlier, so that will give us ones instead of zeros when the values are equal. But we actually want to negate this so we can more easily count the zeros of equal characters. So we can see here that we have one vector with uh, one trailing zero and another vector with uh, one leading zero, one vector with uh, three trailing zeros. In cases where only one matches, uh, only matching characters are found though, we simply repeat the process onto the next block of characters in our string. This is what that could look like in C-sharp. Here we load strings into vectors with AVX instructions. We compare vectors and get mask with AVX2 instructions. We check our mask value to see if any characters aren't equal. And then if so, we use some bit operations to identify the number of characters, doing the negation and counting then the zeros. This snippet though doesn't include any of the defensive checks for instruction support, because as not all CPUs support all instructions. Ideally, you also want to fall back to older instructions, as well as even a non-vector approach for machines that don't support specific vector implementations. Keep these things in mind if you're planning to use hardware intrinsics, otherwise you'll run into some, is some issues. So how much faster does this perform? In this specialized benchmark for trimming, we can get a sense of how much faster it helps in different extremes. We have a performance regression at 10 characters, as we're simply doing a lot more processing than our basic trimming logic would. But anything longer though, we're seeing a significant performance increase, over 83% faster. Depending on our workload, SIMD and other hardware intrinsics can help us have huge performance gains. Another such case might be our data initialization. It might not seem obvious, nor be something that would be significantly slow, but it's worth having a look to be sure. An approach we can take is by having a vector pre-filled with incrementing values up to the vector's length. We then write the whole vector at once into the memory location. We increment the value of the vector by its length. So in this case, we're incrementing it by eight 
and then we just move on to our next memory location. This benchmark focuses on the performance of just the data initialization outside of the whole Levenstein distance algorithm. We can see some pretty large performance improvements compared to our previous general for loop that we've been using. Having a minimum of 50% performance increase sounds fantastic. However, there's a bit more to it than meets the eye. I'm very intentionally only showing how this micro performance of this very specific operation, not how it behaves in the whole algorithm. Because if we do that, we get a somewhat unexpected result. Rather than being faster or even equal in performance, it actually is performing measurably slower overall. I'll be honest, I was kind of surprised when I actually saw this, but it goes to show how an isolated benchmark doesn't guarantee overall better performance. Like I mentioned earlier with G-optimizations, even something as simple as a reordered statement can change the pr processed output. This is always a long shot though, so let's skip any further optimizations here and have a look where we can make some big gains, the main calculation logic. Improving our main calculation logic with SIMD is a bit more complicated. The core problem is vector processing works best when we have a full vector of values. This is difficult to do in the main calculation as we don't have all the values we need for processing, but let's walk through an example with the current way we do processing. The substitution cost highlights, you know, so we've got, we've got no issue there to fill a vector. Same as deletion cost, you know, we, we can load those, no problem. Well, how about the insertion costs? The insertion costs are where we actually have our problem as we only know the first value, but for argument's sake, let's pretend we've got the next three values. So now we have our vectors filled, but wait, we actually have three of the four values we're planning to calculate anyway. So this means that only the fourth value would be new, which isn't really accelerating much. But not all hope is lost. We can still use vectorization in our algorithm. Rather than try and fill a full vector with unique values, we can use the same value in all positions of our vector. This is computationally wasteful. We're making it do a whole bunch of calculations, just throwing them away but it actually helps us avoid branches on our minimum calculation logic. With less branches in our inner loop, we get more performance. In every case, we have a significant performance boost over our previous best, and we crushing the baseline here. We are close to 80% faster than our baseline at 10,000 characters. So far though, these benchmarks top out at 10,000 characters, but what if we wanted to do it on even longer strings? This is where we can add multi-threading to the mix. So let's walk how we could do multi-threading with this algorithm. For this example, we'll split our matrix into two regions with a thread for each. We then start to processing the first row of the left region. Once the left region completes its first row, the right region can start its first row. The left region then can start on its second row. The right region only needs the left region to complete the same row first. The left region can then be any number of rows ahead. To achieve this, the threads need to have a shared buffer between, at their boundaries. The buffer allows setting the appropriate insertion and substitution costs. After the thread on the left writes the data, the thread on the right can then read it. This approach can scale really well across multiple cores by just adding more and more regions as needed. Using all of our other optimizations like single row data, array pool, branch improvements, vectorization tricks, we, can get, we get a performance regression of 19% at 1,000 characters, but an 81% improvement at 100,000 characters. To put it in perspective though, our baseline can't even run 100,000 characters. Yet we can scale this further on more cores than just the small eight cores that I actually ran this benchmark on. With the performance regression though, we can avoid it mostly by having both a path for multi-thread processing and non-multi-thread processing, and we switch depending on the length of the strings. So then we can have the best of both worlds. At this point though, you might be wondering with everything now that I've mentioned, that how can we possibly improve it further? But I've been saving the most advanced optimization for last. So if your brain isn't already mush, it might be shortly. Let's take a look at the calculation backwards for a moment. If I want to calculate the last cell, I need all the cells around it. And if I want to calculate those cells, I will need all the cells around them. You can see here, I've highlighted a cell with two colors as it is both a value we calculate from this outer ring, as well as a cell we use to calculate its neighbors, to the right and below it. 
we've been spending this whole time talking about calculating column by column, row by row, which is where we can hit these issues of cells depending on other cells. Instead, let's take a look from a different angle. Let's tweak the cells that we've got highlighted here a bit. It isn't that we need these extra cells that I've highlighted, but the point of, at this point of the calculation, it might start cluing you in to the pattern here. When we move these green cells further and further away from the corner, we can say that they form a diagonal line, two cells wide. The secret is they also encompass all of the insertion, deletion, and substitution costs we need to calculate multiple cells without any dependence on each other. With the previous data filled in, we can see what that would look like to calculate from this point. The revelation of calculating diagonally by itself doesn't mean a lot if it wasn't for the fact that we've already talked about vectorization and that's where we can take advantage of this. The idea here is that we maintain two arrays of previous costs we calculated. We can then load the array data into vectors, do some processing on it, and write the result into several cells of the calculation at once. The full code behind the solution is way too dense to actually cover in a presentation, but this is the core part that matters for the calculation. We start off by grabbing the appropriate part of our two strings and vectors. Because we're working on, on the diagonal, we need to reverse one of these vectors to compare the values. The trick here is that the loaded strings are signed integers. So when we did the comparison, we get a negative one if the characters match or a zero if they don't. This gives us what I call a substitution cost adjustment. We take the substitution cost that we know from one of the diagonal vectors, adding our substitution cost adjustment to it. Remember that our adjustment is containing zeros or negative ones. So when we're adding here, we're actually subtracting values. We then load our deletion insertion costs, followed by performing all the minimum value logic comparisons we would typically need to do for the calculation. That final line in the block adds one to the result, which would typically only happen if the characters don't match. But because of our substitution cost adjustment earlier, we can safely do this without breaking the algorithm. Finally, we store the calculator result from all of these operations into our diagonal vector to do this all over again. With all of our effort putting into the algorithm now with our fancy diagonal calculation, we can see it perform extremely well compared to not only our non-multi-threaded code, but even closes the gap a decent amount against our multi-threaded variant. Technically, our multi-threaded variant can even take advantage of the same diagonal logic, though it's more complex to do the boundary logic that I described earlier. To put this though in perspective with our baseline, at a thousand characters, this improved intrinsic version is about seven times faster. At 10,000 characters, that increases to nine times faster. The fact that we can squeeze this much performance out of the algorithm is a pretty big deal. With all that said and done though, all these optimizations, what can we really take away from this? Because as much as I've talked about Levin's time distance optimizations, optimization specific for it, I'm pretty sure that you're not actually implementing Levin's time distance. So I think there are kind of three key takeaways here for your own code. Have a performance goal. Know why you're optimizing. If all I cared was about very small strings, I probably could have stopped at the first few optimizations because let's be honest, otherwise all the SIMD and threading stuff would have been a waste of time, but I needed to calculate for 10,000, 100,000 characters. So all of those are actually helpful for me. Knowing what your goal is is one thing, but you can't tell if you hit it without constant measuring. So each benchmark I showed had measurable performance and allocation changes, both positive and negative. Without knowing this information, I wouldn't know if I was wasting my time or not. And then finally, it's how you approach the problem. Throughout this presentation, I switched the approach I took a number of times to get the most out of the code. Initially, I started with some algorithm, algorithmic tweaks, which opened up opportunities to use certain framework features. Later on, some framework features by themselves gave us significant performance boosts. Maybe in your code, there's a way to use array pool or span to remove allocations. Or if your performance goals require it, perhaps leaning on hardware intrinsics or multi-threading will help. And then finally, just got some related links. So Quickenstein is my library to calculate Levenstein distance, which includes all of these performance improvements and a couple of others that I didn't include into a single NuGet package. And additionally, all of the benchmarks and the step-by-step -step implementations to get those benchmark results in this presentation are up on GitHub if you want to check that out too. Anyway, 
I hope you've uh, enjoyed that talk and you've learned a lot of interesting things about performance. Wow. Yeah. Wow, James. That was an amazing talk. That's absolutely fantastic. Um, I'm gonna have to watch that again. That was that was really good. There's lots of really cool ideas in there. The thing which really uh, struck me, I think, was if I found a problem with an algorithm, I'd sort of reach for a profiler first. That would, that would be my first instinct there. But you understanding the algorithm, having a look at what you could do to change the algorithm, understand it in a way so you can like do string trimming and all that kind of stuff is a very yeah. uh, different approach. Did, did you try and look at you know reach for a profiler at all first, or did you just kind yeah. of start to figure out what to tweak so, so initially it was what i wanted to do just it was just allocating so much memory so i'm like that first chunk having to calculate all of like the, to have all of these arrays i'm like well because it was a jagged array so like arrays in arrays i couldn't really use array pool and i already knew about array pool at that point so i'm like so how do i get that down to something else more manageable and then it was just researching actually the algorithm itself so like i can't take credit for working out these algorithmic improvements myself. It's definitely a lot of research and other people far smarter than me have actually done. But then, yeah, it's a combination of benchmarking, a combination of profiling. Um, and yeah, like depending what you're working on, if it's really deep algorithmically, if you can pull parts out and benchmark it, I think you can get the most accurate results because it's running so many iterations of it. But if it's something like a much more like slower operation, or if it's not so much an algorithm per se, but uh, some combination of like other code which doing other kind of processing, profiling can definitely be the way to go. Yeah, um, we're, we're big fans of Benchmark.net as well. It is it can be a really good way of figuring out you know sort of exactly what a small piece of your code is doing. You know, so as you mm. say, running over it several times to get uh, memory and uh, performance usage and everything. But yeah, I'm really struck by the idea of of understanding the algorithm better to be able to not not just tweak it in a way to um uh you know cache a variable here or whatever but mm. to actually understand that fundamentally you can change things the, the string trimming thing just kind of that that yeah. <laughs> that blew my mind before we'd even got to the vectorization <laughs> you know, yeah the, the um, string trimming is like amazing it it again like i covered like it only works best when you actually know that you might have a uh, shared uh, start and ends like prefixes and suffixes or if you've got like such monster like pieces of text that are bound to have that because you're just trying to find a small difference between things so yeah like string trimming can work really well cool yeah. M maybe related to that a question that just came in uh, related to strings and, and trimming the strings yep. will um using all of these intrinsics and, and all will that um Will cache misses actually affect large strings uh, in, in comparing la large strings? Yeah, so w once you start going to this level, you're going to start having to deal with things like how much, um, like how the registers work for what the JIT's applying, the actual like cache lines of the CPU. And I don't cover that stuff because it's still somewhat beyond me as much as I've do dived into like deep uh, technical concepts. But yeah, it's that would be probably some of the next areas to work out of how can you optimize the algorithm further to make sure that, yeah, you don't have cache misses unnecessarily or that you don't have, like I did partially cover, like branch pred predictability problems. Um, but at the same time, it's very interesting to, to see things like the uh, the way the JIT does its bounds checking uh, yeah. uh, as well. That, that's, that was pretty uh, surprising. Um, it's like, I mean, I guess the question is, how, how do you learn about, um, you know, whether that change that changes any better or anything? You know, would, would it be the same on all platforms you're running it on and so on? Yeah, like it, it will depend. Um, so like, I don't cover it too much in the branch prediction side of things, but once yeah, you start getting into say the hardware intrinsics, you're really requiring certain processes for certain things. So. All of my code, both my actual like library and everything I covered, that all of the optimizations for like SIMD rely on like AVX, which is uh, the additional capability for x86. But there's equivalent thing for ARM. There's then other particular ones probably for RISC V. But you, you need to then either know what you're going to be programming and targeting to then optimize for those particular situations, or you're just going to have to implement lots of uh, lots of different variations yourself and just hope for the best.
Okay, so for the hardware intrinsics, I mean, okay, I'm just, I'll probably just walk straight into that. They're, they're different for each hardware, aren't they? So would you have to do yeah. a different implementation for different platforms? It depends. The the um, the um methods and stuff that I was calling, I would, because yeah, a AVX2 exists for, was it like pretty much all modern Intel, all modern AMD processors, but those specific instructions do not exist for ARM. There's equivalent mm. ones that exist for ARM, but they're not exposed via AVX dot whatever. They're exposed via whatever the ARM equivalent is. Yeah, In yeah. Um, .NET 7, I believe, there is a lot of work to actually make it more um, generic. So you don't need to so much touch the, the AVX2 version. You can just go vector, blah, blah, blah. And cool. you can actually have it do a lot more of some, a lot more of these operations. Um, you're still going to be a bit limited for some of them because it could be a case of, you know, 90% of the instructions are all the same between all of them, but then some specific instruction you need, like some permutation of like 128 bits or something only exists on say x86, but then yeah, you just not don't have it available somewhere else. That, that's really cool. Um, the vectorization is something which I haven't have really investigated myself and it it, um, it looks really cool, but I it, it feels like you have to learn how it works. I mean, do you have any tips for sort of how to figure some of these things out? It, it almost I mean, feels like a bit of a jump to, to get to that. Yeah, like some of them I stumbled across. Like um, there, there's a slide that I had about using like SIMD improperly. And that was just from the fact of, I really need to eliminate these inner branches. I'm going to try and just stuff it um, in a vector and see what happens. And then I realized, hey, that just skipped all the branch predicting that the CPU would do, which then increased like the co-performance. But then when you get to stuff like um, the trimming, doing the intrinsic trimming, that's where it's like, okay, I know that my string is just a set of characters, which is just a set of numbers, and I can then put that into a vector. So is there a vector instruction that can just compare all the numbers for me? And then it's just kind of like figuring it out from there being, okay, so now I have this, what's the next step from there? Um, but yeah, but fortunately other people have actually implemented not so much Levenstein distance itself, but just various other algorithms, either in C or C sharp that are already touching various intrinsics. So you can get a good feel for how someone might calculate some of these things. It's all very cool stuff. Um, Martin, have you got any more questions there? Uh, yeah, we, we, we actually just had one come in. Um, in would AOT actually make this faster? Uh, would there be a difference if you run this um, pre-compiled essentially to native codes or just um, have the JITs arrange everything and, and run it through the CLR? I would say you probably would, definitely on the first run. So because the first run would require the JIT to actually do its job, but then for any mm -hmm. subsequent runs after that, um, I wouldn't really know. I'd be curious to try it, but I, I don't really know the actual answer off the top of my head. Cool. Yeah, makes sense. Um, there was also a comment about how it would perform on WASM, but I think that's also something mm. to try, right? Yeah, that, that definitely. Um, that, that's going to be another interesting case because while I do think um, like hardware intrinsics and stuff are available on WASM, that you're kind of again now having to either program now for another set of like vectors or mm. use the generic one that .NET's now coming out with. But yeah, it's you you could win in some cases, but then lose in others. So as much as um, I guess the kind of conclusion thing that I had with my presentation, if you're needing to target WASM, benchmark or however best you can benchmark WASM. I'm not sure if benchmark.net actually works for it, but if you can try and actually get your benchmark results there because you could have huge differences between what can work on your actual computer in just a normal .NET environment to then what can be deployed via WASM. Um, good question about benchmarking though. Do you, uh, I've clearly, you've been using that all the way through the, the presentation there. When you were working on the algorithm, um, did you kind of keep the benchmark results with your code? Did you kind of check yeah. in every step of the way? And so you can yeah. be like, ah, this is no good. I've got to roll back to this version so I can then look at the values again. Yeah. How, how do you manage much. that? Um, well, first it was just a text document. <laughs> yeah. um, so it's, it's, it's pretty much like the crudest way you could possibly have it. Um, in my actual library on GitHub, I've got a couple of um, like markdown files where I just, after I do a couple of optimizations, I'll paste then the new result that I've got on my computer there. But otherwise, if I just am doing it in a pull request, knowing that, okay, this is the angle that I want to actually approach it on. I then just do a comment after every like couple of like 
tweaks that I'm doing to the algorithm. Like uh, Quickstein, I actually have a pull request open for doing a uh, minimum value comparison, which doesn't need branches or vectorization, but it's in my benchmarks, it runs faster in some cases, but the longer strings, it starts running slower, which is also really counterintuitive, but that might be back to the uh, earlier person's question about um, uh, cache misses and stuff that now I might be throwing out something else because now the code is so much longer because I'm loop unrolling or I'm doing something else. But yeah, there's like so many layers of um, optimization which then can start interfering with each other. So you don't know if this one that you're doing is actually better or this one's now worse. Cool. Yeah. Related to better or worse, um, do you have any advice for people doing this in a, in a larger development team? Because, I mean, typically when you squeeze out more performance uh, in your codes, things might become more unreadable or at least uh, less understandable at first glance. Like, how, how do you deal with that? Do you stop at a certain point or just squeeze every drop of performance out? I mean, like, part of me would love to say it's the latter. You get to squeeze all the performance out. But it really goes back to what the actual goal that you're trying to achieve. Um, like I wanted to, my algorithm to work on very long strings. So I had to keep going and just keep going and adding all of these optimizations of optimizations. Otherwise I could have start, stopped at like the third optimization of just doing the single row processing because that eliminated pretty much all of the allocations and was already so much faster than the baseline. But if your code needs to perform in, you know, like one millisecond, but it's taking, you know, like one second of process, well, you're going to have to do whatever it needs to do to bring it down to one millisecond, whether that is something that's as simple as caching some value somewhere else, or um, as complex as diving into hardware intrinsics, you're going to have to do and figure it out for your specific application. There's no broad strokes of, oh, we can just do all our crazy optimizations and make this be like nanosecond fast. Like, we have the library developers of .NET doing all of the actual really complex work for us that we can just take advantage of more sane APIs. But when you actually truly need the performance, you can dive right into it. Yeah, this is fantastic. The the, um, the platform gives you the power to do that, really. It's, mm. uh, yeah, it's like, very cool. Very cool. Have, having span available is such a great feature in .NET. It's one of my favorite APIs because you can just build so many things, parses and other stuff that are now allocation free because you didn't need to deal with strings. You just need to deal with the idea of characters in a span. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Being able to do things allocation free and being able to grab stuff like that is is great because you always need to use a subset of uh, a, a string or of, a, of a, an array or something. So it is, it's a, it's a, a properly good algorithm. Um, um, platform API to have. Yeah. I've done a, like a, a parser for like robots text files. I've got like a DNS query parser and they can all do the same type of thing. They just try and heavily use spans to try and reduce allocations wherever possible mm -hmm. or and then yeah. use a pool for when it really does actually need temporarily an array. Yeah, good stuff. How are we doing for questions, Martin? Have we got anything? Um, I, I think, yeah, so some people are thanking you for the session, thanking you for the for all of the demos. And um, I would like to add my thanks there as well. That was a fantastic first session to uh, Absolutely. essentially blow everyone's minds. So um, <laughs> I, I hope things get better for a lot of people after this, including myself. Um, I think we can probably bring in the next speaker and, uh, and let you go because it's a little bit later there um, where you're at. Yep. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you again for a fantastic session. And uh, yeah, we'll see you next yeah, time. Yeah, very much. Thanks a lot, James. Cheers, everyone. Bye-bye. Cool. See you, James. Bye.